Hello. In today's programme, David Watson and I are looking at the difference that the Holy Spirit made and still makes in the life of the Church. Someone has said that the teaching of Jesus is good, but it sets an impossibly high standard if we try by our own efforts to follow it. So Jesus told his disciples that although he would leave them, the Holy Spirit would come to give them the power to live his way of life. The way that Jesus finally left his disciples is recorded for us by Luke in the opening of the book of Acts. After his suffering, Jesus showed himself to the apostles and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Isn't the ascension something of an embarrassment to Christians? I mean, it does seem extraordinary to be asked to believe that Jesus actually physically ascended up into the clouds. Well, belief in the ascension goes hand in hand with belief in the resurrection. Once we accept that Jesus rose physically from the grave, we have to explain why he's no longer around today. Now, the New Testament writers have no difficulty about this. They all assume that Jesus, although he's no longer actually physically around, yet he's very much alive, and he is, in fact, reunited with his father. And they also assume that the resurrection appearances came to an end at a certain moment in time, and there's no New Testament alternative to this apart from the ascension as the means by which this happened. Yes, but don't you think that the description of Jesus going up implies that heaven is up there, hell's down there, the world's flat, and so on? I mean, aren't these really rather outdated ideas? I I don't think the ascension implies all this at all. Simply by rising, I think Jesus was probably involved in an inactive parable. He was not saying that heaven is 70 miles above the earth, of course not, but he was saying that he was going to where God is exalted. Even today, we link the idea of superiority with that of elevation. We talk about the judge sitting in the highest place in a court of law, or the height of success, or the highest office in the land. And so Jesus was showing in a way in which his disciples could understand that he was, in fact, being exalted by God. The whole point of the ascension is that he was returning to God victorious after the defeat of death. So why didn't Jesus return to his father immediately after he rose from the dead? Why did he keep on making those appearances to his disciples, what, for a 40-day period? I think there are a number of reasons. In the first place, he was there to convince his disciples that he really was risen from the dead. He appeared to them on a number of different occasions in various different locations. He talked with them, he ate with them, and he assured them that he was absolutely real, as real as we are today. He also was there to teach his disciples about the significance of his mission on earth. He explained the meaning of his death and resurrection, and he also prepared them for the time when he would leave them physically. So it was a vital period where he was able to instruct his disciples face to face. Jesus actually told his disciples that they must stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. Why wasn't it possible for them to begin their work straight away? Well, they had no power to do so. Although they were quite convinced that Jesus had risen and was alive, they were afraid of telling other people about this. 
And it was only after the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost that they began to act like Jesus and to preach fearlessly. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Hello, Jews, and all of you who are in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. On the day of Pentecost, the church was born. The disciples had been full of confusion about what Jesus had been trying to teach them. Now they understood clearly. They had been hidden behind locked doors for fear of the authorities. Now they were prepared openly to challenge them, even if it meant death. Although Jesus was no longer with them physically, his spirit now lived within them, giving them the power Jesus had known throughout his life. In the account of the day of Pentecost, we are given two pictures of the spirit, wind and fire. There was the blowing of a violent wind, and tongues of fire rested on the heads of those in the upper room. The Spirit was often seen in the Old Testament as a wind or breath. God breathed life into the first man, and in Ezekiel's vision in the Valley of the Dry Bones, the Spirit is a wind that brings new life to the dead. In fact, the Hebrew word for wind, ruach, is the same word that is used for spirit. Just as our breathing keeps us alive, so when God breathed his spirit into the disciples on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with his life. The spirit is also seen here as tongues of fire resting on the disciples' heads. John the Baptist once said about Jesus, I baptize you with water, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The image of fire was used in the Old Testament to show the destruction of evil or impurity in making things pure for God. 
For example, idols were destroyed by burning them and metals were refined by fire. The prophet Isaiah uses fire as an image for the removal of personal sin. So the spirit, seen as fire, is the Holy Spirit who purified and refined the first Christians for their mission in the world. With the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the disciples at last had the missing factor, the one vital ingredient that had been missing up until then. You see, the thing that had driven them mad about the Lord Jesus was his teaching was marvelous. It was all right. And he lived it out. The fact is that they couldn't. However hard they tried, in fact, the harder they tried, the worse it seemed they became. But now, at last, they understood. Everything began to be tied together. And they understood why it was that, sitting on the well at Samaria, he'd said to the woman, the water I give will be inside you. A well of water springing up to eternal life. And they remembered, too, how he stood high up in the temple courtyard and said to that great crowd of people on a hot and dusty day, anybody thirsty? Well, of course, they all were. Let him come to me and drink. Out of his inmost being will flow rivers of living water. Now they understood, because they'd got that. A river of living water flowing through them. And with increasing excitement, they ran through in their minds the Jewish Bible, and it seemed to them that on almost every, every page... They could find a reference to rivers of life, rivers of living water, fountains of life, fountains of living water, a torrent of life. Now they knew that that had come true for them. And best and most important of all, they knew why after he'd risen from the dead, the Lord Jesus had forbidden them to speak about his resurrection. You see, the last thing the Lord Jesus had wanted was a bunch of people moving out into the world, speaking about new life and looking, frankly, as if they were dead. He didn't want them just to talk about new life. He wanted them to have it. And now at last they had it. The same power that had raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that resurrection life, the power of God himself, the life of the Spirit, a torrent of living water. Now over here, we have a different picture. A water wheel. Now this water wheel is about 100 years old. First of all, powered a woolen mill, then an ordinary flour mill, and a bakery. And was in fact used as one of the first hydroelectric schemes. At one time, on the end of this, there was a dynamo. Now that's very useful for me because the word dynamo actually comes from the Greek word dynamis, the word for power, which is exactly what the Lord Jesus promised the disciples they would have when the Holy Spirit came into their lives. When the Spirit comes to you, he says, you will be filled with power. Now, frankly, at the moment, it doesn't look as if that would power anything very much. It's moving slowly and ponderously. What it needs is a driving force. What it needs, actually, of course, is water. Because a water wheel is useless without water. Now, that's more like it. Now, the water wheel has become a mechanism by means of which the power in the water is being transformed into power to change things. Exactly the same way. The church needs the power of the Spirit so that it can become the mechanism by means of which God's own power can be released into our world. When that happens, you've got all God let loose in the world. looking at the way that the Holy Spirit began his work in the church on the day of Pentecost, does this mean that before this day, the Holy Spirit didn't exist, or simply that he'd never worked in that way before? No, certainly the Holy Spirit existed before Pentecost, because in fact the Holy Spirit is God himself. The Holy Spirit had been active in the life of Jesus, and indeed in Old Testament times, but his activity had been limited. 
In the Old Testament, for example, the Holy Spirit came upon special individuals for specific tasks. He worked when it was absolutely necessary at crucial moments in the history of God's people. And some of the Old Testament prophets, like Jeremiah, looked forward to the time when the Spirit would be in all people, not just in certain individuals, and he would live in us permanently, not just on certain occasions. And the significance and excitement of Pentecost is the promise was now fulfilled, the Spirit had come on all God's people to live in us permanently. And I think it's very obvious indeed the difference that the Holy Spirit made to those early Christians. Uh, does he make the same difference to the church today? Yes, he must surely make a difference in our lives, although it depends on our willingness to be the kind of church that God wants us to be. You see, the Holy Spirit is the go-between. He links God and the church. And if we stifle the Holy Spirit in our lives, then we cut ourselves off from the liveliness and vitality of God himself. And without the Holy Spirit, the church simply becomes a, a human organization, as tragically it's so often been in the past. So what difference should the Spirit make, then, in practical terms? Without the Holy Spirit, the church is rather like an army without weapons. We may have strategies and plans and brilliant leaders and persuasive speakers, but without the Holy Spirit, we really are absolutely nothing and can achieve nothing. So the Holy Spirit comes first to equip us for God's work in the world. We cannot equip ourselves any more than an army can conjure up weapons out of nothing. And the Holy Spirit also not only brings us life, but unites us together. In the early church, the leaders had various dif disagreements and different emphases about this and that. And yet they were, by the Spirit, wonderfully united in love. And today, as soon as we lose sight of what the Holy Spirit is doing, we can concentrate on secondary matters which easily divide us. Now, I'm not saying the doctrine is unimportant, but certainly no person or group of persons has a monopoly of the whole of God's truth. And the Holy Spirit comes to help us to recognize humbly our own human frailty. Also, the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus. Jesus, at the Last Supper, said that the Spirit of Truth will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you. And the church today, when it doesn't look at Jesus for guidance and help, fails in its task in the world. We asked Ian Pettit, a Benedictine monk from Preston, how important he believed the work of the Spirit was in renewing the life of today's church. The church is always needing renewal because the church is a living organism. It's not something dead. It's living and therefore it must be always alive and life-giving. I suppose the temptation always facing the church is to make things safe, to put things into dogmatic statements, to keep the truth like things kept in a museum. And so the Spirit of God is constantly having to work on the church to bring it into new life. Now, I think today there is a very real need for people to understand or re-understand what the gospel's about. I found that too many Christians see Christianity as a performance, trying to do what the Lord Jesus Christ asked us to do, you know, learning to love one's neighbor and grishing one's teeth to do it instead of really calling on the power of the risen Jesus Christ to be that source of new life. And I think that needs to be really found again, the good news of the gospel. Too often, if we see the church as just rules and regulations, not good news, because we can't do those regulations by ourselves. But in the power of Christ, it can be done. The church often works in this way. Everything is well organized. We have our conferences, our doctrinal statements, our liturgies and traditions. Everything's well under control and running smoothly. But there is something missing. The atmosphere is stale and heavy. Then God opens the windows of the church. And for a while we enjoy the freshness that the Holy Spirit brings. The breeze brings a new atmosphere and excitement in the church. But like a breeze, the Spirit is unpredictable. He doesn't seem as concerned as we are for tidiness in the church. He begins to upset some of our cherished ideas and practices. Church leaders feel threatened because they are no longer in control. And so we close the window. And sadly, the Holy Spirit is shut out of the church. Organization can so easily become a human substitute for genuine spiritual power. When Jesus was alive on earth, he was often an uncomfortable person to be with. 
and so can be with the Holy Spirit who communicates Christ to us. In many ways, he can be very uncomfortable. He shakes us out of our rut. He disturbs our complacency. And he sends us out from the safety of our churches into the world. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of mission. He doesn't work to make us secure and comfortable inside the church, but to send us outside to make new disciples of Christ. We are three Christian leaders, what they thought the main work of the Holy Spirit was. Well, to implement his own mission, that was explicitly said by the Lord, I have not finished my mission, I will send you my spirit to introduce you in the fullness of my revelation. You are not able to understand yet so many things, so I will continue and accomplish in you my own mission. And I will do it then on a worldwide scale, since when he was there, it was only 33 years and in a limited way in his own country. So it gives really to the gospel that full extension, the full dimensions of the revelation of the Lord. That's the mission of the Spirit. Do you think that the sending of the Holy Spirit was in any way to replace the presence of Jesus? Not to replace, but to accomplish his presence to really realize the fullness of what you are intended to do and give that universality. So it's not at all I am away and now the Spirit will do my job. No, it's I send you my Spirit, the Spirit of my Father and my Spirit. So it's really to Christianize Christians. I think that's really the, the best meaning. Why, why did he come? Well, it came to realize what St. Paul said in, when he expressed himself saying, I am not living, Christ is living in me. Well, the Spirit is there to make that a reality. What was the central role that the Holy Spirit was sent to perform at Pentecost? I think, supremely, it was the way this group of frightened men who felt that Jesus had failed, he didn't seem to be a person of power and authority, as he claimed to be, um, through the resurrection and then through the coming of the Holy Spirit, um, are suddenly emboldened to go everywhere, uh, being witnesses to Jesus and his resurrection. And this is a kind of enormous reversal, because in the Old Testament, the Jewish, seem, the Jewish expectation seemed to be that... Um, the Gentile nations were going to come into Jerusalem to worship to the temple, and that uh, they'd adopt circumcision and Jewish food laws and all those sort of things. But now, the, the procedure is the other way around. Jerusalem is not the center to which people come in, but the center from which they go out under the guidance of the Spirit, so that you've got sort of ever-widening circles outwards from Jerusalem. And it's this wonderful change, really, from this inwards movement to the outward one, which one sees as, as the, the overall work of the Holy Spirit. I think you see right from the very beginning in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit is given and is poured out, that Jesus said, when the Spirit comes upon you, you will be witnesses unto me uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So from the very beginning, he linked the coming of the Spirit and the advent of the Spirit on his disciples with their being motivated to go out and share the message worldwide. And I, don't, I, don't, I know in my own experience, until uh, Christ became a reality to me uh, in the Holy Spirit, I had little desire to tell anybody about him. Uh, but once the Spirit of God was real in my heart, it was a case rather like in the book of Acts of we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. So I see uh, an integral link. The Holy Spirit is, is given not just so that we may have beautiful subjective experiences, but so that we may be motivated to share the message of Christ uh, with the world around us. The Holy Spirit gives many different gifts to God's people. For example, there is the gift of prophecy where God speaks through a person to address a specific situation in the church. Or there is the gift of tongues, where people are free to praise God in languages they don't understand. There are also gifts of faith, healing, teaching, and many others. Now, all these gifts are given so that the church is fully equipped to speak and work
for Christ's sake in today's world. As well as teaching us about the gifts of the Spirit, the New Testament also talks about the fruit of the Spirit. That is the effect that the Holy Spirit has on the life of individual Christians. Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit in this way. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we grow as Christians, these are the qualities that people begin to see in us. But we need to remember that the fruit of the Spirit, like any fruit, takes time to grow and mature. Crops are not grown to maturity overnight. They need a year of careful planning and hard work before they can be made into useful food for us to eat. At the start of the agricultural year, the hard ground is ploughed up to make way for the sowing of seeds. The soil is fertilised, and as a crop begins to grow in the early spring, it will need to be rolled. Crop spraying takes place to protect the plants against insects. Gradually, over a period of months, with hard work and good weather, the grain will reach maturity when it is ready for harvesting. When we see food on sale, it's easy to forget the time and effort that's gone into producing it. Growth takes time. In the same way, Christians only take on the character of Christ as they grow in loving and following him. This isn't something that happens instantly. Growth needs time and care, as we've seen. And the Holy Spirit who gives us the fruit of patience is himself patient with us in our often slow way of growing. But we can expect the Spirit steadily to change us into the person God is pleased with as we ask him to fill us and to change us from inside. The fruits of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and the whole list mentioned in Galatians are not something that we are able to manufacture. You know, some people see the gospel as trying to put into practice something. And therefore, a Christian is meant to be joyful, a Christian is meant to have peace. And so we have a tendency to go on what I call virtue gathering weekends, where we learn to be peaceful and learn to be joyful. No, it's rather like if you have a cherry tree and it doesn't produce cherries, it's no good going off to the supermarket and buying a lot of artificial cherries and hanging them on the tree. It may look very deceptive. Your neighbor may think, what a lovely tree. But you know, and I guess the cherry tree knows, that those cherries are not the result. And so we cannot manufacture joy and peace. If we want that, we have to sink our roots into Christ Jesus. And then the Spirit, who unites us and shows us who Christ is, will draw out from him the sign that, of his fruit. When someone gets down on their knees, in order to ask God to let the Holy Spirit come into their lives, in order to produce the fruit of the Spirit, does that happen instantaneously? No. I suppose because we live in an age of instant things, we think everything's going to be instant. No. If you graft a branch onto a, a tree, it takes time for that new life to penetrate into that branch and finally produce fruit. And I like to think that when the Holy Spirit puts us into Christ, it's rather like putting a brick into a bucket of water, if I may put it this way. You can now say the water, the brick is in the water, but is the water in the brick? In time, yes, it will penetrate because the bricks are porous. And so when we're placed into Christ, I now have salvation, but I must now know Christ to enter into me for sanctification. And that takes time because he's going to meet my self-centered self and he's got to come against that. Cardinal, what do you see as the signs of the presence of the Holy Spirit within the Christian? Well, that's an easy answer because you find in the Gospel the answer the Lord, uh, St. Paul, gives the enumeration of the fruits of the gifts. You can judge a tree by the fruits. And now the fruits, he give an enumeration, joy, peace, kindness, self-control. He gave all the list there. Well, especially peace, I think. The Lord said explicitly, I will give you peace, nobody will take away of you. It's so deep, it will be my peace. Well, now, if you find somebody very serene and peaceful in every circumstances, especially during suffering, there's something not normal. When I am traveling to Lourdes and coming back in the train with pilgrims, not healed, and peaceful and joyful. Well, that's the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus once said, The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. 
Now, if I carry a full glass and I'm jolted or jogged, what will spill out? Whatever's in the glass. As we are jolted in our daily lives, what will spill out of our mouths will be whatever we are full of. If we're full of greed or self-importance, that is what will spill out. We shan't be able to help it. But if we're full of the Spirit, being daily changed by Him, we will naturally communicate that to others. As the Spirit changes us, only then will He be able to change others through us. By looking at the Holy Spirit in this program, I think one very basic but very important fact has been underlined. The Holy Spirit is not interested in theories. He's an active person who gives the Church the power and willingness to do things, rather than merely to talk about doing them. When we stop treating the Church like a museum, carefully guarding it, and allow the Spirit to make the changes He wants, then we'll see God working out His mission through us. In the next and final programme, David and I will be examining the hope Christians have for the future, and why they have reason to hope. Thank you.